Why do we need version control system? Meet Mr. Bob, who is an investment advisor. And due to all the amazing work he is doing, his client base has increased significantly over time. And so he sees a need to have his own personal website. So Bob had envisioned a website of his own. And Bob being a non-technical guy, he thought of taking help from a freelancer to get the job done. So he met Sundar, who is a freelancer, and explained him everything what he's expecting in his website and gave the deadline as 24th of February, which happens to be his birthday. To which Sundar agreed and started working on the project. Inside Sundar's computer, Sundar had created this folder called Investment App, inside which he created all these files which would make that website. After a few days of work, Sundar had finally finished working on creating the website. He tested it. He also hosted it on a hosting provider or on a cloud service provider, got the application up and running and shown it to Bob. Bob was quite impressed with the work done by Sundar. And so now he decided to add a couple of more features into his website. And he gave the deadline as 20th of February to which Sundar once again had accepted the deal and started working on those additional features. And once again, Sundar had added all those features, hosted it on hosting provider, got the website up and running and shown it to Bob. But this time, however, Bob was not completely satisfied with the work. Even though the latest features introduced after 24th of February were working fine, the features that were working earlier seemed to have broken or are not working as expected. So Bob had explained the same to Sundar and asked him to undo all the new changes and bring back the application to what it was on 24th of February. To which Sundar hesitantly accepted, but unfortunately for Sundar, it's not going to be an easy task to undo all those changes because there's a lot of new code introduced after 24th of February and the code has scattered across multiple files. It's really hard for Sundar to recollect each and every line of code that was introduced and undo all those changes. However, Sundar wanted to accept the deal to keep the client happy. After a lot of sleepless nights and after a lot of frustration and a lot of testing, Sundar finally got the job done. However, this time Sundar missed the Bob's deadline and Bob was wondering why it took Sundar a couple of weeks just to undo the changes while it only took him a few days to create the entire website. This has resulted in Bob being not satisfied. And soon Sundar started to see similar kind of issues with some of his other clients as well. They were complaining that some of the features were not working as expected, which had worked earlier. And so they either wanted to get them fixed or they want to go back to previous versions of their web applications, which were working fine. So Sundar gave it a thought and finally came up with a genius idea which has somewhat solved this problem. We'll talk about it in just a while. So what Sundar had started to notice is that he didn't have backup of his client websites. If he had a backup of their websites, he will have opportunity to either go back to previous working version of their website or at least analyze the problem by comparing one version with the other. So Sundar came up with a brilliant idea to sort of solve this problem. What he started to do now is, for example, let's consider the investment app that we were talking about. Sundar creates a folder called investment app v1 and 14th March, which is the date on which this project was delivered to customer. And then assume that Bob had asked him to introduce a couple of new features. This time Sundar is not going to make any changes in this version of the project. Instead is going to make a copy of that project, name it as v2 and introduce all the new features. And similarly, if Bob were to ask Sundar to add even more features, he's going to make a copy of the latest version of his project, name it as v3 for instance, and then make all the necessary changes, so on and so forth. So every time he introduces a new feature or introduce a huge chunk of code, he's just simply going to copy the folder or the project and make necessary changes. So this time, again, let's assume the same case where Bob was complaining that version v4 is not working as expected and that he wished to go back to version v3, which was working fine. So Sundar doesn't have to take the effort of reverting all the changes. 
he could just remove the v4 folder from the server and replace it with v3 working version of Bob's website. Or if Bob had insisted him to fix the bug, Sundar can actually compare the files between v3 and v4 using a comparing software like Beyond Compare for instance, pinpoint exactly the changes that were newly introduced, analyze the problem and fix the problem. While this has somewhat solved the problem, Sundar started to realize that this is taking up more memory than needed. Because Sundar is not only making a copy of all the files that he had modified, but also the files that he never touched. So this is going to take up a lot of space and it's becoming really hard for Sundar to manage. So Sundar came up with a much better idea, which is actually to create versions of the files inside the project. What do I mean by that? So assume that you once again have a project like this with all these files. Now, of course, in this case, I named them as HTML, but this could be any file. This could be an image file, CSS file, JavaScript file, Java file, whatever. For the sake of this example, assume that we have all these files. Now, assume that Sundar is introducing a new feature, which has something to do with file B and file C. So instead of creating a copy of the entire folder, Sundar is going to make a copy of the latest version of these two files. So he's going to make a copy of file B and file C, introduce all the code required for feature one. And if you were to introduce another feature, and this time assume that the changes needs to go in file A and file C, Sundar is going to simply make a copy of latest versions of file A and file C. For example, in this case, going to make a copy of file A as well as a copy of file C version one, which is the latest version of file C. And then he's going to introduce the new feature in it. So once again, assume that Bob had asked Sundar to remove feature two altogether and that he wished to go back to earlier version of his working website. Guess what? Sundar can just get rid of the V2 files and only keep the V1 files, as simple as that. And if he were to fix the bug instead, he can just compare the version one file with version two file and pinpoint exactly what's going wrong by using a comparing software like Beyond Compare. However, what Sundar started to notice is that even this is not feasible because it is becoming incredibly complex to manage multiple client projects. For example, Sundar needs to rename all these files back to their original names before deploying them to the remote server. And he's also started to notice that his files are ever increasing, which is creating a problem, not only in terms of organizing the files, but also it is taking a lot of space. It is at this time Sundar started to realize that it's time to let a software do the job for him. A software that will manage versions, a software that will track historical changes, create backups, and allow reversal of changes, etc. And this is the core reason why somebody somewhere had to come up with a software that will do this job. And that's the birth of Git. Now, Git does much more than just these, but I'm not talking about them right now because at this point in time, you don't know what is GitHub, team collaboration, branching, merging, and stuff like that. So I'm going to preserve them for upcoming lectures. And I'm pretty sure you must also be having questions like, what is GitHub, what is GitLab, what is branching, etc. Well, you just have to wait for that. I cannot fit everything under a single video. Have patience and watch the rest of the course, and you'll find answers to all the questions you might be having. But truth to be told, I like how Sundar maintains his smiley expression all throughout, no matter how his life is turning around him. Something to learn from, isn't it? What did you just say? No, no, I'm just saying that you have a great sense of fashion. Oh, okay. Let us see how a version control system or simply VCS software works at a very high level. Once again, assume that we have Sundar who is a freelance developer and Sundar has got a new client, Linda, who is a restaurant owner and she wanted to have a website for her restaurant so to accept online orders from her customers. And you can tell by Sundar's smile that he's ready to take up the project. But based on his past bad experiences with some of his other clients, he now have decided to use a VCS software 
to manage versioning. So Sundar in his local computer creates a folder with the name restaurant app, spends a few days and introduces all the files required to create a minimum functioning website. The VCS software will have its own data store to store all the historical data and backups. When I say data store, it doesn't necessarily have to be a relational database or some form of database software. It can be as simple as file system. VCS softwares typically tend to use your own file system to store the backups and historical data. As we progress through the course, you'll understand this concept much better. But for now, just assume that this is some kind of a backup store to store the state of the project. Now assume that Sundar is quite happy with the progress he has made in his project. He has got a minimum functioning website and he has tested everything, everything is working great. So he has decided to save the state of his current project so to retrieve it back when needed. So he's going to instruct the VCS software to store the current state of the project, typically by running a command. Once he runs the command, the VCS software would essentially make a copy of all the files and store them inside the data store. Now assume that Sundar has got a new requirement to introduce feature one, and assume that all those code changes would need to go inside file B and file C. So Sundar has made all those changes, once again, is going to run the command to save the state of his current work. But this time, the VCS software will store the information slightly different compared to how it stored earlier. This is how it's going to store. Since no changes were introduced in file A, the VCS software would only store the reference of the file A. What that means is it will just have information about the location where the file A copy is residing. And the reason for this is obvious. We don't want to unnecessarily make a copy of all the files that were untouched or unmodified and take up disk space. When it comes to file B and file C though, we have introduced new changes, but the VCS software is not going to make a copy of these files either. What it's going to store is actually the difference between the modified file and the latest version of the same file and is going to store the same in the data store. We call each one of these as a patch set. So essentially a patch set is the difference between the original file and the latest version of the same file. And the reason for that is once again obvious. We want to save this space as much as possible. Similarly, assume that we have new feature called feature two, which is introduced and file A and file B were modified. And this is how the VCS software would store the data. So we have patch sets for file A and file B. And then for file C, we're only going to store the reference of its previous version. And similarly, assume that we have another feature where we're going to make modifications to file B. And this is how the VCS software would store the information. Now assume that Sundar is not happy with the version four of file B and that he wanted to get back to version three of file B. So he's going to instruct the same to the VCS software. The VCS software would then pick up the original copy of file B and then apply all the patches that came after it till version three to make up the version three file B and is going to give back to Sundar. He can do whatever he wants to do with it. Similarly, Sundar can also write a command instructing the software to get the entire project to version three, for instance, and the software is going to do just that. Now, obviously there are a lot of VCS softwares available in the market. We have Git, Mercurial, SVN, etc., And they all differ slightly in terms of how they manage historical data. But in general, this is how they manage historical data. Now let's dive deep and understand on for what God's exactly sake. happens. Or what happened? Why? I don't care how it works internally. It doesn't help me with my job anyway. I just want to know how to use the software. Oh, that makes sense. That makes sense. Just one last video and then we'll start installing the Git and get our hands dirty with a lot of practice. How about that? Thanks. You're welcome. Let's talk about distributed version control system. 
Linda is quite happy with the work done by Sundar, and she started to notice increase in her business revenue ever since she launched her website. And due to increasing customer demands, she now has decided to have even more features in her website. For which she once again approached Sundar to do the job for her. But this time, due to increasing demands from her customers, she has a very short deadline. To which Sundar has accepted the deal. But Sundar is quite aware of the fact that he cannot do this all alone, and that he needed to hire a couple of folks in his team to help him deliver the project on time. So Sundar hired a couple of folks, meet Isha and Luke, who are the new members in the team. Sundar has also provided them with a brand new MacBook Pro, shared them the project files or the code, or maybe he has hosted it on an FTP server, shared the link, and asked them to download. And he has also instructed them to install a VCS software on the local computer, given all its benefits. Of course, Sundar has his own local environment and his own set of problems. As they're making progress in the project, Sundar started to notice few problems with using a local version control system. Some of the problems that they were facing are these: no historical changes of other members. For example, if Isha wants to take a look at historical changes done on file A. She can only take a look at historical changes that she has done, but she doesn't have access to historical data of somebody else. For example, Sundar, because she only has access to her own data store, but not Sundar's data store. Now, this is clearly a problem. Unless she gets access to the entire history of changes, she cannot effectively work on a task. Another problem is it's difficult to maintain the latest code base. Whenever somebody makes a change, they need to let other developers know. That they have done that change, and that they need to copy that code into their local machine as well, so to have latest version of the code in all the computers. This is of course practically impossible, especially when you have multiple team members working on a single code base. And things would become even more complicated if two people happen to work on the same exact file. Another problem is no centralized management of roles or access control. For example, assume that Sundar wants to put restriction on Luke that he can only access particular set of folders in the project, but not the other folders. Well, with local version control system, he doesn't have control on that. So Sundar has thought about all these issues that they were facing, and has done a research on Google, and finally came up with so-called a centralized version control system, which just simply means that this time. Instead of having the data store as well as the code in their local environments or on the local machines, it's going to be on a centralized server, and everybody would pick the code from the centralized server, work on it, and then send it back to the server so that others can use their code. And with this, we can get rid of all the problems we had with local version control system. Once again, if Isha wants to take a look at all the historical data of a particular file, she will easily get access to it. Because this time, all the patch sets are maintained in a centralized server, and all the developers would have access to it. And with just a simple command, everybody would be able to get the brand new latest code, and they can start working on top of it, so to avoid conflicts. And Sundar can also have better control as to who can access what, since everything is hosted on a centralized server. He can now start to use role-based access control, and he will have control as to who can access. Which folders of the project, etc. However, centralized version control systems come with their own set of problems. For example, what if server goes for a toss, or what if somebody hacks the server, or what if Isha is having connection issues? Maybe her Wi-Fi is not working. In all these cases, developers cannot work on the project, and they might as well risk losing the entire code if they are unable to record the server. Considering all these drawbacks of a centralized version control system, Sundar had to find out an alternative, and that's how he came across with a distributed version control system. It's basically the best of both the worlds of local VCS as well as centralized VCS, eliminating all their drawbacks. So this time, with centralized version control system, instead of having one single repository, which is the centralized server, here every single developer will have their own server. And each one of the developer will have a copy of the entire history or versions of the code in their own local machine. What that means is, even if the server were to go for a toss, 
everybody have their own local copy of the entire code as well as the historical data. And if someone like Isha were to lose connectivity, maybe because of a Wi-Fi connection, she can still make progress because she's having everything in her local computer. She can make changes and whenever her connection comes back to normal, she can deliver the code to the centralized server so that other developers can get them and do something with it. Or in case of a data loss, every developer is having a backup of the entire code base so they can recover from it. Some of the examples of centralized version control systems or CVS, Subversion or simply SVN or Perforce are some of the examples of centralized version control systems. Some of the examples of distributed version control systems are Mercurial, Bazaar and Git. Git is a distributed version control system. All the developers would have to install Git on the local machine. In addition to that, we also have GitHub which acts like a centralized server. I think we've gained enough knowledge to start working with Git. Okay, let us see how we can download, install and configure Git on our local environment. Now assume that I'm a freelancer and I got a very small project which I feel I can work alone. Forget about team collaboration, forget about multiple people involving in the project, forget about GitHub for the time being and let's just stay focused on Git. So. Go to Google and search for download Git. Click on the first link, but make sure that it belongs to the website git-scm. That's the official website of Git. And once you're there, depending on the operating system you're using, click on the relevant link. Now, by the time you're viewing this page, you might see a different layout, but you got the point. You just have to click the link that is specific to your operating system. I'm using Windows in my case. If you're using Mac OS, there are a separate set of instructions for the same. Just follow them and while installing, you can leave everything to their defaults and proceed with installation. And it's not necessary that you understand each and every step while installing. That's perfectly normal. In case if you have any problem installing in Mac OS X, do get in touch with us and we'll be able to help you. But since I'm using Windows, I'm going to click this. And here I basically got a couple of options, the first of which is the installer version of Git and the other is the portable version of Git. If I download portable version, I can start using Git without having to install it. And this might come in handy, especially if I want to work on multiple computers and I don't want to install Git on each and every computer. I can just dump all these files onto a pen drive or a thumb drive and then start using Git on all those computers. But I'm going to go with installer. I'm using 64-bit OS, so I'm going to click on this. Well, for Linux and Mac users, you might already be having Git installed. You can just verify it by running a command. I'm going to show you that command in a while. Or you might already be having those libraries. You just have to install them. You can defer to the installation instructions for the same. So I have this downloaded. Let's now start the installation process. If you have patience, go through this entire license. I don't have so much of patience. I just click next. Now, while installing Git, you might come across with certain steps or certain prompts or certain terminologies that doesn't sound familiar to you. It's perfectly all right. As a rule of thumb, just remember, keep everything to their defaults and proceed with the installation. It's not necessary that you understand each and every step in this installation process. Since I have worked on Git for a long time, I understand what is being asked here. But for you, you don't have to understand everything. I would only walk you through the steps that I feel you would be able to understand based on the level of knowledge you've gained so far in this course. So I could just leave everything to their defaults. But what this prompt is basically asking us is it is asking us to choose the components that we want to install. We're going to talk about Git Bash and Git GUI in the next lecture. You can just ignore and keep rest of the stuff to their defaults. We don't want to get into too much detail. It's not worth it. Here it is basically asking you to choose a software to edit .git files. I have installed Notepad++ in my computer and I can choose that. And I would also recommend you to use the same software. It is open source. You don't have to pay anything for that. Download Notepad++. It's an amazing tool. 
choose that and click next leave this to default because you don't know what is a branch at this point in time so it doesn't make sense for me to explain you about this step so we're going to leave this to default okay in this step it is basically asking us whether are we going to use git bash only or are we also going to use the command line of windows this step is specific to windows you may not be seeing similar installation steps if you're installing git on other os like linux or mac os you might be seeing a different set of instructions altogether but like i said leave everything to their defaults and finish installation but here if you choose this option git is actually going to add a path variable in system environment variables so that we can start using git commands on windows command processor if you choose this option however it's not going to do that with an assumption that would only be using git bash again we're going to talk about git bash git gui in next lecture hit next we're going to leave this to default basically it is asking if we want to use the existing open ssh or if you already have it installed somewhere you can just point to it but we're going to use the open ssh that comes along bundled with git by the way open ssh would essentially allow you to connect to the remote machine in a secure manner more on it in coming lectures for sure leave this to default as well obviously you don't understand what is commit or is checkout so i cannot explain you anything about this right now leave it to default leave it to default okay just talking about git pull again this is too advanced for you to understand just leave everything to the defaults i'm pretty sure you may not be understanding all the steps in here don't even try to understand it's not necessary we're going to explore everything in coming lectures it's perfectly normal if you don't understand that's perfectly all right trust me hit next enable file system caching yes we want to that would improve performance we can unselect this to an hit install wait for a bit all right i don't want to read the release notes hit finish okay we have now installed git on our local machine let's go and verify if it indeed got installed i'm going to open windows command processor and then type in git so if you're able to see an output like this that means git was installed successfully and the reason we're able to run git command from windows command processor is because somewhere in the middle of the installation process we had asked git to include path variable of git in windows environment variables let me show you what i mean search for environment variables click on edit system environment variables and if you go to path here you would see path to git library so whenever you run command something like git that we've just run windows os is actually going to take a look at all these paths listed in here and then it come across with this path where it has the code to do something with git command and hence we're able to see this output if you remove this we won't be able to run any git commands from windows command processor unless we explicitly go to this directory and do that anyway if all this sounds confusing just simply ignore trust me you're going to understand everything in coming lectures there are basically three ways we can interact with git we can either use git cmd or git bash or git gui or graphical user interface git cmd is nothing but the windows command processor we use to run git commands in fact we had already taken a look at an example of the same in our previous lecture where we were testing the installation of git 
The other option we have is to use git bash, which is a tool we had installed along with git. Git bash is similar to Windows command processor, except that we can use standard Linux commands to interact with git. So this will come in handy, especially if you're coming from Linux background, where you're used to running Linux commands, and now let's say that you are working from Windows operating system. You don't have to take that additional learning curve to understand Windows commands in order to interact with Git. For example, in order to list down all the files in a particular folder, inside Windows command line, you use the command dir. Whereas in Linux, you use the ls command to list down all the files. If you're using either Mac or Linux, they both come with Unix shell and you don't have to install git bash. Git bash is only meant for Windows operating system. If you're not used to either of these tools, then obviously it is always better to choose git bash over git cmd. And the reason being, if you're used to git bash, you can also work on Linux operating system at later point in time if you were to. The third option we have is git GUI or graphical user interface. And as the name suggests, this tool will provide a graphical user interface to interact with Git. Now, I do have to mention that Git GUI does not have support for all the features that Git has to offer. We can do more with Git Bash or Git CMD compared to Git GUI. That being said, Git GUI has its own role as well. For example, if you'd like to take a look at the overall picture or if you'd like to get a bird's eye view of the entire historical changes, etc., then you might find it useful to use a Git GUI compared to Git Bash. However, in the rest of the course, we'd be using Git Bash as this is the best option. We might as well explore Git GUI at some point in the course, but we're going to be primarily focusing on Git Bash, which is also the popular choice. Let's take a look at some of the basic commands we can run on Git Bash to interact with the Windows file system. Now, if you're coming from either Unix or Linux background, you probably know all these commands. Feel free to skip the video. You don't have to watch the rest of the lecture. And for others, you might be wondering why do we have these commands? Well, on Windows, we create folders, take a look at what's inside it, or delete folders. We do that graphically that Windows provides us. However, if you want to do the same from git bash, we need to use these commands because git bash doesn't come with a graphical user interface. Now you might be having another question. Why do we need to interact with the file system using these commands when we can do the same on Windows? Well, the answer is you can do it either way, but if you learn these commands, it might be helpful to you in the future. For example, if you were to work on Linux operating system, you don't have Windows OS there. You have to interact with the file system using these commands. And these commands are not difficult to learn either. They're actually pretty self-explanatory. For example, we have mkdir stands for make directory. And as the name suggests, it will help you create a directory or a folder. And then we have cd stands for chain directory. It will help you change from one directory to other directory. And this is the command we use to navigate within the file system. And then we have PWD stands for present working directory, which will just print the directory on which we're currently at. So while working on git bash, if you ever wonder on which directory you're working in, then this is the command to run. And then we have ls stands for list, and this would just list down all the files in a particular directory. And this command combined with option hyphen a would list down all the files, including all the hidden files. And then finally, we have rm stands for remove. And as you might be guessing, this will help us delete a folder or a file. Now, some of these commands would go with certain options. We'll explore them in just a while. I've created a test folder for the sake of this lecture. And this is where we're going to experiment with all those commands. First of all, let us launch git bash. You can launch git bash either from the start menu or you can just simply right click and click on git bash here. This would launch git bash in the current directory. You're going to see a screen that looks something like this. Let us start off by creating a new folder. So guess the command that I need to use. 
It's mkdir stands for make directory. And I'm going to provide the name of the folder or the directory that I wanted to create. Let's call it my app or whatever. So this has created a new directory. In order to make sure that it has indeed created a directory, let us run the command ls to list down all the files in the current directory. And sure enough, we see the directory that we've just created. We can also append an option hyphen a to list down all the files, including the hidden files. But at the moment in this directory, we don't have any hidden files to show. But this command will come in handy in future, especially when we want to explore the git directory, which is hidden. Now let us get inside the my app directory. How do I do that? Guess the command. It's cd to change the directory. And I'm going to mention the directory. Hit enter and we're currently inside the my app directory. To make sure that we're inside this directory, let us run the command pwd to check the present working directory and this would print my app directory. Now let us go to the parent directory of my app. So how do I do that? We do cd space dot dot slash. If you want to go to grandparent directory, then you just type in one more dot dot slash and that will do the trick. However, I just would like to go to the parent directory. Now let's do ls command to list down all the files. Now let's say I want to delete this folder. Guess the command. It's rm and the name of the folder. But this is not going to delete the folder. Well, it doesn't delete the folder either because this user doesn't have the permission to do that or this folder might be having files in it and it is asking us to delete those files first. Only then will it allow us to delete this folder. However, we know that this folder doesn't have any files in it. So it has to be the other reason. In order to work around this, we have to include an option along with the rm command and that is hyphen rf. R stands for recursive and F stands for force. Recursive would mean that we're saying not only do we want to delete this folder, but also all the files in it. And F would mean force. In other words, we want to force delete the folder regardless of the permissions. And I'm going to specify the name of the folder and this time it does delete the folder. If we do ls now, it doesn't show that folder anymore. So take five to 10 minutes and try to experiment and play with these commands. Basically just try to create folders, delete folders, take a look at what's inside the folders, etc. You've probably heard of git commit, but what exactly is it? Let's take a look. Imagine that you're playing a video game and assume that you have made enough progress in the game that you don't want to risk closing. So you save the game at that point in time by giving a meaningful message. You continue playing the game and make some progress. And once again, you feel like saving the game and you do just that by giving a meaningful message. And if something were to go wrong with your game, you just take a look at all the list of saves you have made and load the game at a particular point. Now you need to note that the save here is not actually a backup. It is kind of like a snapshot. For example, you cannot just copy this save file and take it to another system where the same game is installed and be able to load the game from that save point. It's not possible. However, if this is a backup, you would take backup of the entire game altogether. For example, if game is inside a folder, you would just copy the entire folder, take it to another system and start the game where you want to start. So save here is essentially like a snapshot, but not exactly a backup. Similar analogy can be explained with Windows restore points. You might be creating multiple restore points by giving a meaningful message. And if something goes wrong with your system, maybe a virus or something, I really wish that doesn't happen. But if something like that happens, you just take a look at all the list of restore points you have created, choose one of them and restore the system back to its earlier state. And just as you have restore points for Microsoft, 
or save option for a game, you have git commit for your project. So you're going to make some progress in your project. For example, let's assume you have worked on feature one and then you feel like you've done enough to save the project or commit the project. You do just that by using the command git commit. And then you continue with the project. You work on another feature and then commit the project with a meaningful message. And if something goes wrong with your project, then Git will allow you to go back to earlier state of the project or revert a particular file to its earlier versions, etc. And just like save is not a backup in a game, Git commit is not actually taking a backup of your entire project, but rather taking a snapshot of your project at that particular instance of time. Assume that you have created a project with all these files and now you feel like you've done enough to save the project or commit all the changes to the repository. Now you can't just go and run the command git commit and mention all the files that you want to commit. It doesn't work that way, unfortunately. There's an additional step involved before you commit. And there's a reason for that. For example, you could be having other files in the project which are not meant to be committed. You don't want other team members to be able to access these files. For example, you could be having some auto-generated files or you could be having certain files which are intended only to be used locally but shouldn't be available to outside world. And that's why we have an additional step where you need to let Git know what are all the files you want it to track. Currently, all these files in your working directory are not actually tracked by Git. You need to explicitly tell Git what are all the files you want it to track. You can do that with the command git add. You want to use this command git add and you'd mention all the files. In this case, we're going to mention file A, file B, file C, and file D and run the command that would essentially copy all those files into staging area. And this is when git will start tracking these files. And once you do that, you're going to use git commit command to sort of commit all the changes to a local repository or sometimes termed as object database. And this is not the only case where you might be needing git add before git commit. Let's take a look at one more use case. Imagine that you have a couple of features to work on and you simultaneously worked on both the features and assume that feature one changes went inside file A and file B and feature two changes went in file C and file D. Now we want these two features to be going on two different commits, not in a single commit. How do we do that? If there is no concept of staging and if we were to use the command git commit, that would commit all these changes. We don't want that. So with git add command, we'll first add all the files related to feature one and then we'll commit the changes with a meaningful message. Just as we have given a meaningful message while saving a game, we're also going to do the same in case of commit. Now, once you're done with that, we're going to add file C and file D and commit as feature two. Over a period of time, we're going to maintain all such commits in our local repository. And that way, we would be able to take a look at all the historical data, we would be able to revert our project back to its earlier state. Or we can revert a particular file to a particular version from its past history. Or we might want to take a look at the difference between the current version of the file and its earlier versions so on and so forth. We're going to explore all that in coming lectures for sure. And eventually, we're going to push all these changes to a centralized repository like GitHub. And that's how other team members will be able to access your changes and also all your commits and historical data. However, that's the topic of another chapter. I also should mention that when I started using Git, I joined a local GitHub community and asked them this question. Why do we need to have couple of steps to commit the changes. Why can't we just have a command that looks something like this? You're going to mention git commit hyphen m and then you're going to give a message and then you're going to list down all the files that you want to commit. That might be corresponding to feature two, for instance. Well, I didn't get any satisfactory answer from them. In fact, if you talk about other version control systems like Mercurial or Subversive, 
they don't have this additional step of adding the files before committing. Let us see what it means to git initialize a project. In order to understand this better, let us assume that I've got a freelancing contract where I was asked to create a web application for my client. So inside my system, I've created this folder with the name my app, inside which I'm going to introduce all the files required to create a minimal working application up and running. Now I could create all those files using the new option here, but I'm actually going to do it using git bash just so that you'll be familiar with all those Linux commands. And the command that I need to use is called touch and then I'm going to specify the name of the file. For simplicity, I'm just simply going to call it as 1.txt. Now obviously it doesn't make sense to have a txt file to write the source code, but we're not really interested in creating applications here. We want to learn Git, so you need to make certain assumptions. Similarly, I'm going to create 2.txt. I got the name wrong. And 3.txt. Let's rename this to 2.txt. So I've got all these files created, but currently none of these files are actually managed by git. For instance, if I were to run the command git commit now, it's going to throw a message saying not a git repository or any of the parent directories. So we need to let git know that it needs to manage our project. And the way you tell it is by using a command git init stands for initialization. Once we git initialize the project, we're essentially asking git to set up everything it needs to set up inside our project to now start managing our project or create versions when we ask it to. And if you notice, it has actually created a hidden folder with the name .git. This is where we have the staging area that we've talked earlier. And this is where we have the object database that we've talked earlier. In case if you're not able to see this folder, then you need to enable the option to show the hidden files and folders. Inside Windows, you need to go to the View tab click on options, click on change folder and search options. And once again inside the view tab, you should be able to locate that option to enable or show the hidden files. And here it is. Click on this option that says show hidden files, folders and drives. Hit apply and OK. And you should be able to now find this folder. Let's take a look at what's inside it. Now obviously, it's not really worth going deep and trying to understand everything what's inside here. We will explore some of these in the rest of the course as and when we find it appropriate. But for now, I'm just going to give you some overview as to what's inside this folder. So we have this hooks folder inside which we have a bunch of scripts. These scripts would define what needs to be done before and after a particular event. For example, we're already aware of the commit event and then we have the script with the name pre-commit. As the name suggests, it does something prior to executing the actual commit logic. So git might run this script prior to executing the commit logic. So we might be having things like validating the syntax, etc. If you're really curious as to what's inside these scripts, you can right click and open it up with Notepad++ and just go through all these comments and try to get a sense of what it is doing. But I don't recommend you doing it. Don't confuse yourself. And then we have the info folder inside which we have this exclude file. Let's open it up with Notepad++. If there are any files in your project that you don't want Git to consider, this is where you would list them down. You can also use patterns. For example, you can say star dot log. And now git would ignore all the files with any name but has the dot log extension. Just an example. And by the way, exclude file is something that is local to your computer. And whatever you add in here is only applicable within your own repository inside your local system. 
If you want to have exclusions across all the team members, then there's a separate thing for that called git ignore. We'll talk about it in coming chapters. Next we have the objects folder. This is where Git would store all the historical data or the version history. And this is what we're referring to as the object database. Well, currently this folder does not have a lot of data, but once we make few commits, you're going to see this folder getting populated. You're going to see a bunch of folders getting created inside the objects folder. We have the riffs folder, but let us not talk about it because to understand this, you need to know what is a commit object, hashing, etc. So we're going to skip it for now. Config file is something we'll explore in next lecture. The description file has something to do with Git web. And since you don't know Git web, it doesn't make sense for me to talk about it right now. The head has something to do with branching. So we'll talk about it when we talk about branches. Let's move on. One thing I should also mention is that git init is a safe operation. Meaning that let's assume that I've worked on my project for a while and I've made few commits and then accidentally assume that I run the command once again inside our project. This is not going to do any damage. Everything would remain as it is, as if we didn't run this command at all. However, if you delete this folder, then that's going to cause trouble. You're going to lose all the historical data, all the version history, etc. And then you would either need to reinitialize the project by running the git init command and start from scratch, or you need to check out the project from the centralized repository which we'll explore in coming chapters. But as a rule of thumb, you should always remember not to mess with this folder unless you know what you're doing. The fact that it is hidden by default should tell you that it is not intended to be used by developers like you and me, but to be used by Git itself. However, there might be instances where you might need to bring some edits or do something inside this folder. For example, we've already talked about the info exclude file where you might want to add some exclusions. But otherwise, in most of the cases, you don't want to mess with this folder. Just leave it to git. Okay, let us see how we can configure git credentials and try to understand its actual purpose. We now have a project initialized by git with a bunch of files. Let us now try to run the command git commit and see what happens. Git will kindly ask you, please tell me who you are. In other words, it is asking, okay, I'll commit changes for you, but who the hell are you? And it has also provided instructions as to how we can introduce ourselves to Git is by running these commands. But this is not just about you introducing yourself to Git. There's actually a real purpose of you configuring these credentials. For example, let's say that one of your team members received a defect or a bug assigned to their name, saying that one of the feature is not working as expected. In the process of analyzing the problem, they're going to take a look at all the historical changes of that file. And then they come across with a change introduced earlier, which seemed to have caused the problem or which seemed to have broken a feature. Guess what? They're going to get to know the name of the person and the email address of the person who made those changes. They're going to contact them and ask them to fix the bug. But how does Git know all this? It is when you configure these credentials inside your Git. When you make a commit and push all those changes to the centralized repository, which is going to be GitHub, it will also store this information as to who has done what changes. And it includes your name as well as email address. So if you introduce good code, somebody will come back and praise you. Or if you introduce bad code, somebody will come back and blame you. In most cases, it is always the blame anyway, but no comments on that. So let us see how we can configure the credentials. And Git has already provided us how to do that. So let's use that command git config hyphen hyphen global. 
when we set this global option what this means is these credentials are available across all the projects all the git projects that you create inside your system pertaining to this particular user if you set this to system for example then these credentials would be available system wide meaning every user in the system will have all these credentials applicable and we also have one more option that says local that means these configs are only available for the current repository where you're working on so first let's try with local maybe and i'm going to first set the name you can set any name of your choice but it has to be your name and i'm going to hit enter and i'm going to set email as well okay now let's take a look at where these are actually populated so that's inside the git folder remember in our earlier lecture i mentioned that we'll talk about this config file well this is where all those credentials would be set now let's try to set these credentials at the global level and this time this would be populated under users directory inside your c drive let me pull that up so inside the users directory you should be able to locate the git config and this would get reflected over there and similarly if you were to set the system wide credentials you can do that i don't expect your computer to be used by multiple people and they all contributing to your work but anyway let's set this up for system user though you need to have permission so let us launch git from the start menu as an administrator and then we'll be able to set the credentials so git config i'm sorry this is supposed to be system wide changes user name i'm going to say and this has worked and these would be reflected inside the program files let me take you there so inside program files git etc directory you're going to see the git config file and this is where the credentials would be populated and by the way i should also mention that local credentials will override global credentials and global credentials will override the system level credentials so git will try to get the local credentials first if they're not available it will try to search the global credentials otherwise the last option would be the system credentials if none of these are set then obviously you're going to see an error you can also take a look at the credentials by running a command git config list so somewhere here you're going to see the name and email like so you can also give an option to see a particular level of credentials let's say local for instance and you can also be more specific about what information inside config you want to take a look at you want to take a look at username for instance and it's going to print the value of it let us see how we can stage and unstage the files inside git repository and as i had mentioned before we need to stage files before we plan to commit them so currently we have 
three files inside our working directory, let us plan to commit them. Let me expand the window so that you get a better view. Also let me type in the command clear to clear out the screen so that we get a fresh view. I'm going to do ls to list down all the files and we currently have three files. If I try to do git commit now, it's going to complain us saying we have untracked files inside our project. We need to have at least one file tracked or we need to have at least one file in staging area to be able to commit and that's what it is complaining. Now how do we stage these files? Guess the command. Well git has already given us a clue. It's git add. So let's do git add and I could just list down all the files I wanted to commit. For example, 1.txt space, 2.txt, so on and so forth. This would be useful if you want to be selective as to which files you wanted to commit as part of a particular feature. However, in this case, I'd like to commit everything. So I could just use a wildcard character star. I can also use a pattern. For example, I can say star.txt and this would stage all the files with any name that has .txt extension. So let's run this command. This is what we need. So this has now staged all our files in staging area. How do we make sure it has staged all our files? Well, there's a command to check to see the status. That's git status. So git status command will show us list of untracked files, list of files that are being tracked files that are modified, etc. This command will come in handy to check the status of our project. As we progress in this course, you'll understand more about this command. So after running this command, our files are listed under changes to be committed. And it has also turned the color of these files to green, representing that these files are now being tracked or these files are in staging area right now. Versus an earlier case where all these files are listed under untracked files and are marked red. Now assume that I wanted to remove one of these files from staging area. Maybe because I've accidentally added it in here. How do we do that? Well, git has already given us a clue as to the command we need to run to unstage a file. That's git rm with hyphen hyphen cached option. Whenever I say cached, or indexed or staged, we all mean the same thing. Keep that in mind. So git rm hyphen hyphen cached, and I'm going to list down the files that I wanted to unstage. If I want to unstage all the files, I could use a wildcard character like so, and this would unstage all the files. Let me do that. So this has unstaged all our files to make sure that it has unstaged all our files. Let's use the git status command. And as you can see, they are back to untracked files section and they're once again marked red. Let's add them back again. Let me this time try to unstage a single file, maybe 2.txt. You need to make sure that you use this option cached. If you don't use this option, then this command will have a different meaning, which we'll talk about in coming lectures. So this has unstaged 2.txt. Let us now check to see the status of our project. And as you can see, 2.txt is now listed under untracked files, whereas the other two files are listed under changes to be committed. So take a moment and try and experiment with these commands to stage and unstage the files and check the status simultaneously. Don't commit the changes just yet. We're going to talk about it in next lecture. But don't hesitate or be afraid to experiment with all these commands. You might be feeling these commands are pretty simple and straightforward at this point in time. But as we progress in this course and as I introduce more and more git commands, you will start to feel that they're very confusing. So the only weapon you have to avoid that confused state of mind is practice. I cannot emphasize how important it is to practice all these commands. Otherwise, you'll soon confuse yourself. See you in next one. Let us see how we can commit our changes to git repository. By the way, when I say git repository, I could mean 
our project folder with .git folder. Or I could also mean the object data store that we've talked earlier. It depends on the context. To avoid the confusion, I'm going to call our working directory or our project folder as git repository. I'm going to refer to the object database as the object database. Just to avoid confusion. So currently we have all these files in place. Let us make sure all these files are staged. So I'm going to do git status. We have one file which is not staged. So let's do git add 2.txt to stage it. Let's do git status once again. And we have all our files staged. I'm going to say git commit hyphen m. And then we're going to provide a meaningful message. Why do we need to provide this message? Well, basically it describes the changes that you're committing. So at later point in time, if you or somebody else in your team were to take a look at all the historical changes or historical commits, they get to know which commit is what by looking at its message. For example, you could be committing changes to fix a bug or add a feature. As a good practice, in real-time applications, we follow a specific format for this message. The first is going to be combination of alphanumeric characters, which is essentially a defect or a feature ID that you pick from your defect tracking tool. If you're working for an organization, then you might be having a defect or feature tracking tool. You'd pick that ID and enter it over here. For example, it could be something like WI some numericals. W stands for work item. It could be something else for you. And then you're going to provide a descriptive message. And even this message would be picked from the title of the defect, from the defect tracking tool. I'm going to say my working app or whatever. Let's hit enter. And all the changes that were staged would now be committed. And in order to make sure that we have all the files committed, let's do git status. And it doesn't show anything, which means we don't have any files to be committed. Now let us go ahead and make a modification in one of the existing files in our working directory. For that, I'm going to use the command echo just to fill one of the files with a text. My text in file one, for instance. And I'm going to dump this message inside one.txt file. This command is equivalent to opening the one.txt file and entering the text, my text in file one. Let me hit enter. Now I'm going to use the cat command to see what's inside the one.txt just to assure you that we have this message over there and it prints out the text inside one.txt. All good. Now this is a change that we've introduced, which means we need to stage this in order to commit this. So let's do git status once again. And this time it's going to say we have one file which is modified. So we need to do git add to add this file and bring it to staging area. Git status, it turned green, which means it is ready to be committed. So I'm going to once again use the commit command to commit the changes. Let's remove the defect ID for the time being. And let me just give a meaningful message. Modified file one, for instance. Hit enter, get status, and sure enough, we have our changes committed. Now let's consider a case of deleting a file. So for that, I'm going to use the command rm stands for remove, and then I'm going to specify the file name. Let us get rid of 2.txt for instance. Now this command is not specific to git. This is a typical Unix command. Hit enter. I'll do ls to see if it got deleted, and indeed it got deleted. Now this is a new change which is introduced in the project. Guess what? We need to stage it and then let the git know that we have deleted the file. And so it gets reflected in the object database as well. So git status is going to show 
that file has been deleted, but this change is not staged. So git add foo.txt git status and we have changes which are ready to be committed once again git commit with a meaningful message this time let me not enter any message and hit enter and see what happens well git would open up text editor that we had chosen while installing git in my case it is notepad plus plus for you it might be something else and here we need to enter the message which we would otherwise enter with hyphen m option. I'm going to say deleted file 2. Save the file and simply close it and it has committed our changes. When we used rm command we removed the file and then we had run git add command to stage those changes. However, we can do these two steps in one go is by using the command git rm. So this time instead of just rm, I'm saying git rm. This will not only remove the file, but will also stage those changes to staging area. Let's delete 3.txt for instance. I'll do ls and as you can see file got deleted. But if I do git status, Unlike in case of rm command, this time the changes are already staged and you can directly commit the changes. Git commit hyphen m deleted 3 file. Now let's take a look at all the list of commits we have made by running the command git log master. Master is the name of the branch and is also the default branch. We're going to talk about branches at later point in time, but for now just blindly run this command to see all the list of commits you've made. So the most recent one would be shown on top. As you can see, we have our first commit with my working app message, and then we modified file one, we deleted file two, we deleted three file. And I also can see the author who has done that. It is me in this case for you. It would be whatever you've entered while configuring the credentials. When we have centralized repository and when we have a team working on a project, you'd be able to see all the list of commits done by multiple team members. And if you were to spot a commit which is causing trouble or which might be breaking a feature, you can get hold of the author by writing an email to them.